After missing two Sundays with you, it's good to be back on the pulpit and it's great to see the familiar faces and your smile as well. It's good to be together and to worship our living Lord and Savior together this morning. Before we get there, um, any birthdays today or <gasps> there's a hand? Emma. Emma. OK, so we are going to sing happy birthday to Emma. Any other birthdays? There are some subtle smiles, but I don't know what it means. Should we sing the happy birthday to anyone else? No, let's sing it to Emma. Happy birthday, Emma, and God bless you. May you know his love and care for you each and every day of, of your new year. Um, next Sunday is our family service. Please come and bring your loved ones for a shorter interactive service. This will be an excellent time to bring your friends, to give them a flavor of our church service and to have a cup and a chat to get to know your fellow church family members better. The following family service will be delayed by one week in April. It will be not on the first Sunday, but on the second Sunday, because that's Easter Sunday. So we will have a short family service on the second Sunday of April, the Easter service, followed by a couple as well. The choir will be practicing for Easter. The first practice will, will be in 10 days time on Tuesday, the 7th of March from 7.45 to 8.45 here in Caridor. The next um, practices will be announced later. The World Day of Prayer service will be this Friday. Anyone is interested can join in to Regent Street on Friday um, from 7.30 or in Kirkobin starting at 7.45, I believe, on Friday in Kirkobin. As we are coming closer and closer in time, um, Coffee in Caridor will be on this Tuesday from 10 a.m. This is an excellent time to meet some people from the community, to share things with one another, to listen to God's uplifting word. And Doran will be with us this Tuesday morning, giving us some insight into all the government aid and support and um, everything that um, those who, um, who are in need or we would like to spread the word, how can they apply to, to different grants and supports in this time of need. So please come and learn. And if you want, you can even spread the word as well. We are meeting in the Caridor Community Center um, at 10 a.m. on Tuesday. It is with sadness I announce the death of Eric McVeigh. The house and funeral arrangements are strictly private, honoring Eric's personal wishes. Please keep the family circle in your prayers. In preparation for the election of the new committee, the session will be meeting on Wednesday, the 8th of March. So not this Wednesday, but on the following Wednesday from 8 p.m. And now the call to worship. May the grace of God be among us and the peace of God be on our hearts. Amen. Let's stand and worship God by singing our opening hymn, Amazing Grace. And our pianist has a request. I know it's really hard to, to break uh, well-established um, patterns, um, but she's going to play a short intro introduction. So if you sit comfortably at your place, you might miss the first note and, and you might stand up only during him singing. It's okay, but maybe it would be better to stand up a little bit sooner. Um, that is our pianist request. So let's see what can we do and how can we break tradition. Thank you for challenging us, Rebecca. <laughs> um, let's stand and sing Amazing Grace. Oh 
right, boys and girls, I'm not going to, no, not asking you to come forward um, this morning, but you can work together with those who are sitting around you. Today we are going to come up with some rules and I need your help. I want you to think about all kind of rules that you know. What, what sort of rules do you know? What, what kind of rules do you know? Anything at all? No rules? <laughs> Put your hand up to ask a question. All right. Thank you very much, Emma. Um, how do you, make a work class? you have to do your homework. You have to finish, complete your homework before you can play. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. What other rules do you know? Yes. No fighting. Mm -hmm. That's a good one. That's a good one. Any other rules? No sweets before dinner. Mm. Is, it, is it easy to keep that rule? Okay, any other rule? Okay, you are not allowed to go outside. You have to ask permission and it's better to stick to the others. Yeah, okay. Any other rules? You are either too shy, you are... Oh, oh so many hands, yes. Make your bed. Make your bed? Okay, what else? No lying? No lying? I love it, yeah. Do you know any crazy rules? Like, when, when, when we were uh, with my sisters, we were at your age, uh, we always had to have the same amount of hot chocolate between the three of us. And we had really sharp eyes, and our spoons were ready to take out, to scoop out. If if um, if my sister had one drop more hot chocolate than me, then then I was I was um, more than willing to create the order <laughs> and to obey the rules to to have the same amount. Do you have any crazy rules like that? Okay, um, we are going to collect the five most important rules people can have today. So please help me. What would be on the list of the five most important rules people can have? No fighting. No fighting. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to pray for that because, because that, that's an important one. No fighting. Yes. No lying. Mm -hmm. I write it down. No lying. Okay, what else? What other most important rules could people have in their lives? Bullying. No bullying. Or, or you must bully others. <laughs> no, no bullying. Okay, good. I'm, I'm glad. <laughs> we are on the same page. No bullying. Okay, that's three. Be kind. Be kind. Mm -hmm. Not only negative, but positive rules as well. Be kind. Yes, I saw some hands up there. Be kind. Yeah, okay, good, good. Be kind. That has two votes already. And any other rule, most important rules people could have? Don't disobey God. Hmm. Don't disobey God. Okay, so no fighting, no lying, no bullying, be kind, and don't disobey God. Okay, I think we could keep going on collecting um, lovely rules and prioritizing how much we agree, and, and we could vote on uh, what, what five rules to keep. Rules are not always easy to keep, right? Sometimes it's really tough. For me, no sweets before dinner, yeah. Um, and there, there are some other rules that sometimes are hard to keep, but rules are there for a reason, right? There are rules to, to protect us. In the Bible, God gave us rules, ten commandments he, that he gave to his people. And do you know the reason why God gave those ten commandments? To help people to show how much 
we love God and how to love others, those who are living around us, how to show God that we love him and, and how to care for those who are living around us. You are going to learn more about that. But before we do that, let's put our hands together and say a simple prayer. Let, let us pray. Dear God, thank you for giving us rules that remind us how to love you and how to love our friends. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Rules sometimes are not easy to obey and to live by. But we need to trust God that he can see the bigger picture. He knew what's best for us. That's why he's given us rules. So let's stand and sing, trust and obey. Be careful when we are setting. <laughs>
All right, boys and girls, have fun at the cool church, kids, as you are going to learn about the Ten Commandments and how to love God and how to care for those who are living around us. And we will see you soon again. Mark chapter 10, verses 24 and 25. Jesus said to them again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Let's join together in prayer. God, you heap your love upon us like a parent providing for a family's needs, embracing a child with tenderness. Forgive us when, like spoiled children, we treat your generosity as our right or hug it possessively to ourselves. Give us enough trust to live secure in your love and to share everything we have freely with others in open-handed confidence that your grace will never run out on us. God of love, these are testing times for our world. It has been hard to witness yet another earthquake in Turkey and Syria this week. The pain and suffering of the people in both of these countries are unimaginable. We continue to pray for all those who are grieving, all those who are injured, and all of those who have lost everything. The grim anniversary of the war in Ukraine this week reminds us how fragile peace is. As people who know your divine peace, we ask for peace in our life and in our world. We pray for the leaders of our world as they work out how to react to the violence and make decisions that will impact many people's lives. Help us to be part of the solution to the problems of, of the world faces. God of love, these are testing times for our country. Many people are still really struggling with the cost of living. We pray for people who are finding day-to-day -day life hard. Thank you for those who are trying to help, for the food banks, advice centers, and community interventions, bringing some relief and hope. Give volunteers the energy and funds they need to keep going, and help us, your people, to look after those in need in our community. The ongoing disputes continue to impact many people's lives. We thank you for the discussions this week within the NHS, but we ask for resolution for the many other people in different sectors seeking new pay deals. May people negotiate in good faith and find a way forward that will bring an end to the disputes. Give wisdom to all our politicians that with their decisions they would stop inflation and work in our interest. We also pray for our children as they navigate the complexities of social media and the internet. A new NSPCC report this week around the danger of children and the abuse they suffer is upsetting. Please protect our children and young people. As a church, may we work hard to safeguard all the young people in our care and create safe spaces in which children can flourish and grow in their faith and in, in their trust in you, Lord. 
Help your church to reach more children and young families with your genuine love, grace, and care. God of love, these are testing times for some of our friends and family. We pray to surround Peter and Christine, along with the wider McVeigh family. Be their hope and their strength in their time of grief. We want to ask you to be with people in our communities who are suffering at the moment, with illness, grief, or situations that are very difficult. We pray for friends and family struggling with mental health issues and depression. We pray for our loved ones who are in need of your healing touch, your strength, your power, your grace and love. Hear their names as we whisper them to you quietly in our heart. God of love, help us when we are tested to do the right thing. Help us to make decisions that are full of grace and love. Help us to put our trust in you and be people others can trust. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand to sing our next praise. O God, our help in ages past. About a month ago, I preached on the Father's love for us. And after that, after the Sunday, um, the next Sunday, I brought a message that um, we can live from the approval of God 
instead for the approval of people. Because we can't please everyone, but we can please God. We cannot please everyone, but we can please God. There at that service, we learn the difference between mercy and grace. Mercy is not getting what we would deserve. And grace is getting what we don't deserve. Grace is getting what we don't deserve. This is where we pick it up today as we start a new four-part series learning about God's grace, getting what we don't deserve. And we are going to watch a short video. Today we will discover that God's grace is more than forgiveness. God sends his grace to teach us a new way to live. Here's a story you might not expect to hear in church. For some it may be difficult to hear and I do understand why. It's a story about an abusive husband and his wife. The husband was a rageaholic given to fits of anger and horribly those moments sometimes overflowed into violence like the time he slammed his wife up against the kitchen cabinets or the time he slapped her across the face and then in horror and shame he ran off to find a quiet place to tremble and cry the wife a christian forgave her husband each time he came home. He said quite accurately that I don't know what comes over me. The wife loved her husband deeply and saw many good sides of this flawed man. But she lived in fear that the next rage riot might bring a harm that would not heal. So she stayed with her husband because each time he sincerely begged for forgiveness. And she knew her duty as a Christian was to forgive and to extend grace. The only thing she knew of God's grace was forgiveness. She had been told all her life that she was powerless over sin and that God's grace came to forgive and to restore her relationship with God. She was enough of a Christian to understand that if God had forgiven her, she should extend the same grace to others, especially to her husband. She knew a small piece of God's grace but only enough to put her in danger. So today's message is God's grace more than forgiveness. It's God's grace that forgives and restores. And it is sweet forgiveness. We would have no chance without it. We couldn't approach God had he not shown us his grace. So his grace and his forgiveness is sweet. But in the story you heard, forgiveness alone was filled with torment, unless there was something more. Because true grace never enables us to keep on hurting others the same way over and over and over again. 
just we have done before. That is not true grace. If we look at the wife in this story, we want to scream, get out. It's not safe for you. Get out. Any sane Christian understands that the woman has no duty to remain at home and risk injury or death. Because of some notion of grace expressed as constant forgiveness over and over again. If we look at the husband in this story, we can see a man trapped in thoughts, emotions and behaviors that will harm everyone he loves and will ruin his own life as well. A sympathetic view of the husband understands that he too is tormented, a tormented soul in desperate need of help. Help beyond merely wiping clean his sinful slate. The most gracious thing his wife could do to, to move out and demand that he gets the help he needs to overcome his deep anger and pain. Every Christian marriage is between three. There are is between three parties: the wife, the husband, and Jesus. And often at Mary, at weddings, we recite the verse that a cord of three strings cannot easily be broken. So, what about Jesus, the third member of this marriage? We could not imagine Jesus telling a homeless man, go your way, be warm and filled, without giving him food and clothing. This is not Jesus. Neither we could imagine Jesus leaving this husband alone in his condition, a captive to anger and fits of rage. Jesus wouldn't leave him alone without effective help. Next slide, please. Beyond the characters in this simple yet heavy story lies a larger question. What about us? Would a grace-filled God leave us in the condition he finds us? Would he spend his days reminding of our shortcomings, demanding again and again prayers of repentance and sorrow? In other words, would a grace-filled God keep us in the cycle of sin, repentance, sin, repentance, sin, repentance, of the same thing over and over again? Would the loving creator just graciously wave his hands, go and sin no more, you are forgiven, do whatever you want? In other words, does God's grace mean only forgiveness? Leaving us alone in our rage, our addiction, or our isolation? A cold and comfortless God he would be, if that were so. You see, the problem is not with God the Father or with his grace for us. The problem is our understanding of grace of God's ongoing work in our life. Jesus will not leave us to ourselves any more than he would leave a beggar in the street. Anyone who suggests so misrepresents the true grace of God. So what does God's grace do in our life? Next slide, please. Grace forgives, but it also guides. Set aside the question of heaven or hell after we die for a moment. What about heaven or hell while we live? God's grace is available to lead us, to guide us right now, today. The fabric of everyday life is alive with the grace of God. In Jesus, we have God's grace, 
So he will forgive us after we sin, after we fail, after we mess it up. But if we wait with turning to God until we have sinned, we miss out on a big chunk of God's grace. We can turn to God in temptation. While we are being tempted, while we struggle, we can turn to God to guide us, to lead us, to empower us. His grace is available to us as we are facing temptation, as we are facing challenges. Remember, grace is so much more than just forgiveness. Next slide, please. Our text today is Titus chapter 2, verses 11 to 14. It introduces us to grace in ways that are both familiar but also unfamiliar. The Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, was writing to a young pastor, Titus. Titus had traveled with Paul, and Titus had been trained by Paul. What's more, Paul had great affection for this young disciple, calling him my true child in the faith. Here's what Paul thought Titus about the scope of God's grace. The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in this present age. While we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. In this passage, the word grace appears right next to phrases like self-controlled, upright, and godly lives. What kind of grace is this? If grace only means forgiveness, why does the scripture also talk about learning a new way to live? Most believers are very familiar with the grace that brings salvation. But not many have ever heard of the grace that teaches us to say no. No to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in this present age. Most believers are familiar with the saving grace capable of securing heaven after we die but have never considered the possibility that God's grace can nurture us in this present age. So let's look at the four key points of this passage. The first one is grace brings salvation. Grace brings salvation. This is the part of God's grace most Christians know, and this is truly wonderful. It's foundational to our faith. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourself. It is the gift of God. Receiving what we wouldn't deserve. But this is the starting point of our Christian life in Christ. But just the start. The good news gets even better. Next point please. Grace teaches us to say no. Okay, to fresh you up a little bit, would you please all say no with me? No, no. Grace teaches us to say no. God doesn't want us forever trapped in a cycle of sin and forgiveness, sin and forgiveness in the same area. So grace keeps on working for us teaching us how to resist temptation and ungodliness. That's right. We can call on the grace of God before we would fall into sin. 
so we can break the cycle and we can get out. We can say no to temptation by the grace of God and asking him to push us through from this situation. We make the decision and he gives us the strength to get out of the of that track. Next slide, please. Grace teaches us how to live. Because there's more to Christian life than salvation and saying no to sin. There's so much more in this life, in this Christian life. God's grace is available to replace our sinful habit patterns with self-control so we can live upright and godly lives. Remember, Jesus came to bring us life to its full. Or as the message translation puts it, Jesus said, I came so they can have real and eternal life. More and better life than they ever dreamed of. If it's a better and more life than we can ever dream of, then it could not be based on our plans, right? But we can learn it by allowing God's grace to teach us how to live. And finally, the fourth point. Grace fills us with hope. Do you see the connection between um, these verses? Life in Christ is not meant to be a desperate fight against sin, nor even a narrow focus on godly living, what I should do and, and, and what I should, um, how I should behave. Verse 13 says on the next slide, while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, in verse 13, we see that it's God's grace that fills us with hope. Hope for this life and for the next everlasting life. Would grace allow sin to rule over us all the days of our lives? Why would grace leave us naked and bleeding on the side of the road? God's grace is after more than wiping the slate clean week after week. The grace of God wants to teach us a new way to live. And if grace is the teacher, we are the students and all of life is the classroom. If we possess the humility to, to become learners, God's grace not only transports us to heaven when we die, but it brings heaven close to us while we live here on earth. <coughs> Next slide, please. This is part of the good news. Grace not only forgives our sin. Grace teaches us how to live a life that is no longer captive to sin. Too many believers are stuck in an unhealthy pattern, we choose sin, which is bad enough, but worse, still afterward, after we fell, a voice in our head tries to drag us down deeper and deeper. It's the voice of the adversary, Satan. He whispers enticement before our sin and shouts condemnation at us after we fell. Satan is killed in subtle influence, followed by paralyzing guilt. It's a voice filled with accusation. And he is a liar and the father of all lies. Lies are his native tongue. Sin brings death. It's true, but God's grace wipes away the penalty of death and the stain of sin. Even better, grace does more. It raises us to life 
and teaches us a new way to live. This is the glory of God. He speaks to us even in our sin. The great alchemist turns our sin into the stuff of restoration. His message is restoration. And what's more, he takes our defeat and turns it into the very fabric of instruction. God wants us to learn from our past sin and go and sin no more. Have you ever learned from your sin? This is grace. God is not only ready to forgive, he is eager to teach. If we are open to God's voice, even our sin becomes grace in his hands. He will show us the path and correct our steps. Not by insisting on obedience, but by revealing our hearts to us. Not by counting our sins against us, but by teaching us a new way to live. For example, if I fall into anger, Jesus wants to reveal the source and heal the weakness that led to sin. If I choose greed, Jesus wants to reveal my insecurity and heal the weakness that led to that sin. If I choose lust, Jesus wants to reveal my desire and heal the weakness that led to that sin. If I choose judgment, Jesus wants to reveal my pride and heal the weakness that led to sin. Do you get this? God wants to heal the weakness that led to our sin. Next slide, please. What he asks, he empowers. Jesus said, go and sin no more. Sorry, maybe we can, we can go back to the previous one. Jesus said, go and sin no more. He also makes this command possible. He takes us to the source and gives us hope. He empowers us to sin no more. This is a kind of resurrection. A resurrection from a life of sin. A resurrection isn't just for Jesus, it's for us too. It's not just for the end days. It's so we can walk in newness of life. Sin puts us in a tomb. And Jesus rolls away the stone as often as we need. Our application of these verses can be very personal. We can pray, we can listen, and we can learn. Let me explain. Please go to the next slide. In our daily prayers, we should include prayers like this. Spirit of God. Please open my eyes and heart to recognize your grace works in my life. It's also part of God's grace to answer prayers like this. See, Jesus assured us in Matthew chapter 7 that if we ask him for bread, he will not give us a stone. He will answer prayers like this. We can be confident that God will answer prayers like this one. And after our time of prayer, it is our opportunity to learn. Make a few notes of what came to your mind. What did you discover about God as you prayed and listened to him? What did you discover about yourself? You can be sure that God will lead you toward a larger understanding of grace. In the coming week, what might happen if you try this exercise once a day each day? This exercise is not about merely gaining biblical knowledge, though that is important as well. 
But this one is about opening our eyes and ears and our lives to the deeper grace God has in store for us. God's grace wants to teach us a new way to live. True, on the way, we will stumble and fall all along the day, each day, every day. But there is always grace for forgiveness. Better still, there's even more grace available to us for each new day and every new situation. Come, let's join together in prayer. Lord Jesus, we praise you and we worship you for you laid down your perfect life for us. Thank you that we can be for, forgiven only because of you. Thank you that your blood paid the ransom, paid all the punish, for all the punishment we would deserve for our fails and mistakes. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for giving us a new chance each and every time. Thank you that in you, Jesus, we are forgiven. And thank you for the power that is available to us right now to break sinful patterns and to walk with you. And thank you that your grace knows our weaknesses. Thank you that, that you will lift us up each and every time we fall. And thank you that you will strengthen us to, to fall less frequently and to get better and to get stronger in receiving everything you have prepared for us. Bless us, Lord. Holy Spirit, please open our eyes and our heart to recognize your grace that is at work in our lives. Amen. We started our service singing one of the most well-known and loved hymn about God's grace, amazing grace. Now we are going to sing a newer one, and this one is all about grace as well. Yet not I, but through Christ in me.
now. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the intimate friendship of Holy Spirit be with us all, now and evermore. Amen.